OK, uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, metaprogramming in C++11, which probably doesn't sound very relevant. But uh, I think we have made it relevant somewhat in that it's very fast. Um, I'm going to start with uh, a little bit about uh, how I got here and a little bit of context. And then we're going to look at some of the new patterns that we've been using. And that's going to be a little bit slow because I want to make sure people understand them. And at the end, I'm going to build to pretty complex stuff. So sorry if you get bored in the middle. <laughs> um, I actually started out you know, most of the, uh, uh, my career, I've been programming assembler on microcontrollers. So this is kind of a weird uh, niche for me to get into now with metaprogramming. But uh, the, the problem was uh, programming an assembler doesn't scale well, right? And I'm very good at shooting myself in the foot. So I uh, tried to find a way to not do that anymore. And some people suggested C. And uh, I'm not really have time to get into sort of my impression of that. Um, I also got a book from a friend of mine. It was actually my first real C++ book, which meant I had to read it a bunch of times. Um, and that kind of you know, gave me the idea, well, OK, I have all these rules. And I know, like, if I look at the code, that's going to be wrong. So why can't I teach that to the compiler, right? So that it can notice that I'm wrong, and I don't have to think about it. And actually, um, with enough work, you can make enforce a lot of rules on microcontrollers. The problem is uh, it's slow and not very scalable if you want to scale it to just insane degrees. Because you know, if, if you think, OK, um, what about uh, initialization? I want to look at the entire initialization of every uh, hardware module and see if they are uh, using shared resources in different ways in one initialization, which you know, would then be like order of initialization uh, um, problems and so on and so forth. And that's you know, many, many, many operations. And so, Basically, uh, I was you know, not limited by sort of my imagination or you know, ability to write uh, more complex expression templates. I was limited by compile time and when the compiler crashed. Right? And so I, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, looked at a bunch of other libraries and actually saw a talk by uh, Joel Falcou and uh, um, Edward uh, Alligand, I'm probably bitch butchering that last name, uh, at Meaning C++, and they presented BridgeAnd. And I looked at some of the other stuff and said, OK, this is stupid that I'm doing this kind of all by myself. There shouldn't be like as many libraries as there are people that want to work on libraries. That's kind of a stupid concept. So I became a BridgeAnd developer. And uh, you know, some of the stuff I did actually was better than their stuff, like the sort, because I really needed a really powerful sort. Um, and then, you know, one of the one of the th other things that I didn't really like about BridgeAnd was uh, their higher order meta functions, which they have basically just taken from Boost and modernized slightly. Um, and in sort of talking about how we could improve that, I actually saw this piece of code, which was basically Eric Niebler showing off. Um, and it actually, you know, th this is this is uh, his. He has basically two ways of doing higher order meta functions in meta. And this is the slow version that's insanely powerful. You can basically define variables and then in more deeply nested contexts, like you know, call an algorithm, it calls an algorithm, it calls an algorithm. And then way down there, you can see the parameters which you defined before. So you can do things like uh, Cartesian product all in higher order meta functions. And I thought, oh my god, that's cool. We could make a DSL for TMP. Right? We could just make higher order meta functions so powerful and so fast that that's the way you program TMP. And you, you, know, you, you wouldn't have to have uh, uh, template disambiguators everywhere. You wouldn't have to have people know crazy syntax. It would just, they'd have to learn this DSL and then it'd be good. And so this is what I built in BridgeN. This has actually been in there for about a year. Um, I never ended up documenting it because I was never happy with it. And the reason is uh, there are a few things to rec uh, reconcile here. Um, we can't really make these things eager, or they will try to 
you know, they will resolve to something and they have placeholders in them that need to be swapped out later. And so that doesn't work. And so you have to have like this lazy namespace. So you, know, you program normally, you use an eager namespace that just resolves to the result, kind of like the underscore T's in the standard library. And if you um, are programming in higher order meta functions, you have to use the lazy version. And the other problem is, um, even though, uh, you know, you can also look at parents' parameters. I solved it a slightly different way. You know, basically super, and you can nest them like super, 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 and then you can go to like several nesting depths up and look at whatever parameters it had. Problem is, it evolved originally from the boost higher order meta function syntax, which means we have uh, potentially data dependent ambigu ambiguities, right? If you have a placeholder in something, uh, like in here in transform, if transform has a nested uh, colon colon type, then that is in, uh, 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 interpreted as a lazy meta function. And if it doesn't, then we just put the types in and then that's a type, right? So basically, depending on uh, data, there could be different specializations that may or may not have a colon colon type. So you can't just like JIT this into something more performant and then uh, you know, compile time JIT this into something more performant and then interpret that for every data point that you're given, like in your transform or whatever. Uh, you have to reevaluate the entire thing, you know, walking it, looking for placeholders and, and uh, um, uh, evaluating it differently depending on whether they exist or not uh, for every single data point. And that means it's slow. Like it's, it's probably somewhere on the order of magnitude of you know lots of the handwritten stuff that's not by you know experts, but uh, um, it's still you know three four x slower than normal bridge and, and uh, we'll get into that's also slower than they can you could be, but we'll get into that in a minute. So basically, my idea of a DSL for TMP failed, right? And um, I had a lot of microcontroller stuff to do. And so I wasn't really finding time to continue optimizing Bridgean, but I got a really, really talented intern. And you know, my idea was, OK, I'm going to teach him metaprogramming for like an hour and a half a day for you know, a week, and then he'll know metaprogramming. And as I said, this is like an insanely talented intern. After three days, uh, he said, oh, I wrote this algorithm, and it's faster than yours. And I looked, and it was actually faster than mine. And according to Metabench, mine was the fastest in the world. So after three days, he was kind of at that level. And so I told him, OK, yeah, why don't you work on BridgeAnd? And I will do more of the microcontroller stuff. And he said, well, OK, well, let's see. How do you reason about complexity? I said, well, no, that what I was doing is thinking of 10 ways to do it, benchmarking them all, and the faster one went in, right? Like, I did, wasn't doing this very academically. And he's like, no, 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 that's not the right way to do it. We need to be able to talk about, reason about complexity. So we didn't know any, like, compiler front end people. And there probably are, like, only several people in the world that could have answered those kinds of questions, like, what operation is what cost compared to other operations. And so we basically just treated the compiler as a black box and did sort of empirical research on it. Um, you know, he built a uh, Linux kernel which had absolutely nothing that we didn't need for the compiler and ran tests that would take hours because you're running the tests like 10,000 of times to get down to a very, very, very small granularity. Because before that, we thought aliases were free, right? Like, you can't really make a benchmark where an alias call makes a difference. But he came up with uh, sort of a, a general what's fast, what's slow um, of operations, which we internally call the rule of heel. Uh, and you know, basically, I mean, there's some compiler guys that are going to heckle me, uh, because this is kind of my mental model of a compiler, like the, the abstract compiler, if you will. Uh, and it's going to be wrong. But uh, you know, looking up a memoized type, okay, I have a name and I need like some AST node that, that corresponds to that name. Adding a parameter to an alias call is pretty much the same cost because it's pretty much, you know, the same thing. Uh, adding a parameter to a type is actually more expensive. Like if I'm instantiating a new type and I instantiate one with one parameter less and one parameter more, what's the difference there? Because not only does that thing have to be looked up, it also has to be stored in the type, right? Because it's one more parameter that's associated with that type. And then uh, calling an alias is about 
five times more expensive than adding a parameter to an alias call. Like we kind of, you know, the way we talk about this is, you know, this is one time quanta, right? And so an, uh, uh, an alias call is like five time quanta. And instantiating in a type, um, again, just my mental model, sort of the Sean Parent subway map of the world, understanding how it must be, uh, a type has like a variadic amount of parameters and a variadic like amount of stuff in it. And so it's an unknown size, so it must be an allocation of some kind, right? And that kind of works in my mental model because this is not very constant. Like these are actually pretty constant. This is very, you know, context dependent, but it's, you know, for the sake of an argument, 100 time quanta or 50 times, you know, somewhere around there. So it's way slower than, than calling an alias. Um, and then if you get into like instantiating function templates and Sweeney and stuff, like instantiating a function template, there may be other overloads where you may need to do work to figure out what the overload set is. It's not just about instantiating that one function template, right? If you're doing Sweeney, then you may have to look at your overload set, uh, you know, several times. And yeah, it's, it's, it, it gets very, very expensive at this end, right? Um, so we came up with a library that works mostly using aliases, like down at the bottom end of this, of this list, right? I mean, the problem is you can't, I mean, you obviously can't just use memoirized type tape to look up because you have to create them at some point. And you can't just use aliases exclusively because <clears throat> you can't make like different control flow paths, right? You can't decide on something. You can chain 10 aliases behind each other, but you could have just as easily put all them in one alias because there's, I mean, there's no conditionals in there, right? Um, but, uh, like, you know, with, with this sort of data, I mean, my kid was waking up in the middle of the night, like every night, and I had to carry around in circles. And if you're carrying a kid in the middle of the night and it's dark, that's a very low input-output bandwidth kind of a situation, but you have a lot of compute power because you have nothing better to do, right? So I kept thinking about, <clears throat> you know, how could we combine, combine these things in a way that we're mostly using aliases? and memoized lookup. And that resulted in sort of this performance. This is, this is the quasi-MPL. These are uh, meta, bridge and, and uh, um, metal. And uh, here Dimoff, I think, is, is uh, um, uh, I'm not sure what he's doing differently. But th these are all essentially the same implementation. Here's Han up here, the orange one. And here is you know, boost MPL. Uh, um, so, you know, if, you, if you're thinking about sort of the viability of sort of another new uh, metaprogramming library, um, on Visual Studios or pre-C++14, this is the complexity you're using. This is about 40x slower than um, the uh, quasi-RMPL. But this is actually an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Uh, you know, we're not using higher-order meta functions. If we were, it would be like up here. And uh, we also have some other stuff that gives us more of a, an advantage. But it, it doesn't really matter. I picked this example because it's here it's very easy to explain why we're faster. Replace if is actually a, not a very complex thing, right? You basically need a conditional with which you decide, OK, is that thing the thing I want to replace? And if yes, then I replace it, right? So if we're analyzing this uh, according to the rules of heal, right? We're creating a conditional true AB, a conditional false AB. You know, they're resolving to A and B here. So we're creating two new types, right? And there's no real way to get around that. Uh, problem is, if we say, OK, conditional of BA, we're creating a third type, right? We already have a true case, already have a false case. But the data is also in the parameters of the meta function. So it's going into the type. So every time we have different data, we're creating a new type. Whereas conceptually, we only need really a true and a false case, right? I mean, if we were to say, OK, exact same signature, this is the exact same as that one. So here, it's just type lookup, right? So the other way to do this is to make a conditional just specialized on the bool. So if we have a conditional false, we get this specialization. If we get conditional true, we get this specialization. And then a nested alias that actually works on the data. So basically, what we're doing here in the conditional, we're selecting which alias f is, 
right? Here true, OK, that's going to be this f, and this f will just resolve to the first type, right? Here false, that's going to be this f, and that's going to uh, resolve to the second type. And now if we switch, change the data, we're not instantiating a new type here, right? Conditional false, that's just type lookup f of ba, that's just an alias call, right? And you know, if, if you have, I mean, this is the problem. You can't ever say anything is faster than something else, or else you're going to find some certain use case where it's not, right? So this is going to be much faster in the case where you actually have lots of different kinds of data. Um, I mean, it's basically uh, creating true and false is amortized in a, in a, you know, a large program. Um, so it's just going to be a type lookup and then an alias call. Um, this... Oops, this, however, if you actually have the same signature, is just going to be a type lookup, right? So we're one alias call slower in the case that it already exists. So if you have a conditional that's happening, you know, 50 times or something, this will start to get slower again. However, you can actually decide where you want memoization to happen where you don't, right? Like in a typical algorithm, you're going to have input parameters, a whole lot of processing, output parameter. And if you model that to where it's all alias calls, you're going to have input parameters, no type creation, output parameters. But the input will be memoized and just short circuit to the output, right? So you, know, you do want memoization in some cases, but you don't want it everywhere. And so this gives you a choice, right? Um, so if we want to package this up into a replace if, well, you know, basically we're just variadically going through. We could just put a conditional in here. The problem is uh, we would be using t's in two places, in one pack expansion. One's an alias member of the other one. That I've, I'm not a language lawyer, but that definitely word doesn't work on most compilers. Um, so we're packaging it up into its own, um, you know, the, the 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 predicate into its own uh, uh, type. And this is not as expensive as it looks because. You know, pred is just going to be created with one, you know, once for every combination of meta function and replace value. And then after that, it's just looked up, right? Um, this pattern we're going to see a lot, right? This is a, um, a, a struct with sort of fixed parameters. It, you know, it's essentially, it's a closure, right? Or it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a functor, or, you know, however you want to think about this, right? You have fixed parameters here. And this sort of the function call operator in that analogy, you get a second set of parameters, and you can use both inside of this body, right? And then we can also pass it around or use it as if it were just a normal eager meta function, as in an alias, right? Um, you know, this this implementation is still dirty, but we'll get into that later. Um, we don't just have transform-like things. Uh, we also have sort of recursive fold-like things. And you know, here we are, fold again. Uh, I mean, Han is not on this. But I think that has something to do with the fact that Han is still definitely worse than BridgeN, and we're already in order of magnitude faster than the BridgeN. I mean, you know, not, not, not trash talking against Hannah. They have other stuff they're doing, right? They're providing a better interface. They're uh, providing uh, fusion-type stuff. Uh, you know, if, if, if you are programming in a context where you, you know, you aren't going to run into compile time problems, definitely use HANA. It's, it's, it's way better, sexier, you know, more useful, whatever. But there, yeah. Um, so here's how we do this. This is, again, pretty much the same pattern, right? We take a, uh, a struct, specialize it with every different kind of operation that we want to do. In this case, we don't have any more to recurse over. We do have more to recurse over, right? Uh, you know, if we've if we've uh, folded until the end, then we just want to return the result or resolve to this result, as it were. And if we're not at the end, well, you know, we we tear off two. Uh, um, that cursor is really making that look like a weird ASCII character. Anyway, we tear off two types and put put them through the function, and the result is then putting one type back, and uh, we're calling ourself again. Although since we don't have a template specialization, right, we have to you know, decide ourselves whether we want to recurse here or there using the size of the pack. Right? Um, so this is you know, 
this is also creating essentially after the first call, right? The first call is going to create one of these and one of these. But after that, it's creating no unnecessary types, right? It's just creating, you know, if you're adding them together, well, it's going to create every, every uh, sum along the way, but no more types that have to do with the recursion and the, and the working on the data, right? So this is going to be faster. But we also have other tricks up our sleeves. I mean, one thing we went really crazy with in BridgeAnd was something called fast tracking because uh, you know, we're working on one type and then we're calling the alias again, right? And you know, according to the rule of heal, that's going to be an alias with many, many parameters. And you know, many, many alias calls with many, many parameters is still going to be slow. If we were to say detect the case where we have, you know, add another overload, which is the case where we have more than 10, and then bite off 10 and then just uh, fold them flat at that point, you know, we, we uh, bite off two here, result goes directly into the next one that's, that's uh, yeah. Um, then we can not only deal with max recursion depth, because we're biting off 10 rather than one per recursion, um, we can also make it uh, somewhat faster. And you know, what, we've, what we've done in, in uh, uh, Quasi MPL is we've made a fast track for every second power of two up to 64. Um, so uh, we want to look into uh, uh, composition, right? Uh, we often do a replace if and then a fold left, right? That's a relatively common operation, right? Or a transform and then a fold left. Um, the way metaprogram works now, we uh, do work, return a list, call another meta function with that list, which needs to unpack it again to turn it back into a pack. That's another type that we're creating just to unpack it because we need uh, uh, specialization to be able to get at the parameters. So if we look at here, this list, it basically f just, you know, it, it'll fulfill the signature of a, of a template template parameter. Why can't we just pass in the next thing that we want to do, right? Well, because we were kind of sloppy in our implementation, these aren't all types, right? So the signature would be weird. So we need to turn this into an into a, uh, um, interface with just types. And the other thing we need to do if we were to pass in something here, list would work fine, but if we wanted to pass in a fold left, we'd still need to tack on the functor somehow. But we already have meta closures, right? Which we saw earlier, right? We can, we can uh, take fixed arguments and uh, have a, a sort of nested alias and pass that nested alias around. It's got the fixed arguments as part of its signature. Well, it doesn't really have a anyway. Um, but we can use the fixed arguments and the passed in arguments uh, in order to uh, um, do our operation. And then we take as our last argument the next thing to do, right? And we can chain these indefinitely. The next thing to do can also have a next thing to do until we eventually get to something whose next thing to do is an identity, and then that breaks the chain, right? Which means we can leave things in parameter packs rather than Every, every operation, putting it back into a list and then unpacking it again and then putting it back into a list and then unpacking it again, we can just do the work and then pass the pack on to the next thing that does the next piece of work and then pass that pack on to the next thing that does the next piece of work, right? And I guess I kind of have to go fast now because I just saw the sign, but... Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry. If you look at this here, though, I mean, sorry about the... Oops, that's not the right button. Uh, sorry about the, uh, the line break here, but... You know, this sort of pack expansion of a predicate, this is essentially a transform. This is not even a replace if, right? So we can just implement replace if in terms of transform. And this costs us one alias call per invocation of the meta function. Not per element, but just per invocation of the algorithm. So it's, it's free, right? So, uh, you know, most of Quasir is implemented in terms of other algorithms. Um, we can actually go less than zero cost composition in some special cases, like a, a partition. Well, uh, if you get your input as like a list and then you're calling a remove if and a filter, uh, you're unpacking that list twice, right? Once in remove if and once in filter in sort of classic type-based map programming. So we created a thing called fork, which basically takes a variadic pack of closures or a list of closures and takes the input parameter pack and calls every one of those closures with that input parameter pack. So it just needs to be unpacked once, right? And that's essentially the only thing we're doing differently than these guys. Uh, 
besides having a faster join, but I don't have time to get into that. But uh, you know, half of this performance gap is just the fact that we have a fork, right? So we don't have to unpack twice. Um, yes. Um, Hannah's not on this graph. Uh, if you look at like naive Hannah, I mean, if you see us over here, we're about 0.05 seconds. Um, naive Hannah partition, you know, with potential data types, is something like three and a half seconds at 300. So it's almost two orders of magnitude slower. Yeah. Sorry, the question was where is where is Hannah on this graph? Um, I'm sure there's like a Hannah types, which is a little more performant, but. Um, yeah, I mean, the, you know, I, I think back in the day, uh, the comparison to type-based stuff was removed on the part of Hannah, probably because it would just slow down traffic. Travis, I mean, I don't really know. I, I, I haven't benched Hannah types in this in this uh, uh, example. Um, if you get into some of the serious composition, you can find benchmarks where you actually are two orders of magnitude faster than Hannah. Um, you have to look, but it's more average, somewhere around an order of magnitude. But you can't do all the cool stuff that Hannah does. <laughs> So higher order uh, meta functions, I already, I already, uh, 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 yeah, I already dissed boost for this, and you know, okay, this was this was a long time ago that this was f dreamt up, and it was genius at the time. So you know, I'm yeah, but now I think this is pretty outdated. I mean, can anybody like off the top of their head say what this is doing? Hands. Okay, that's what I thought. I mean, that's the problem, right? Uh, this is basically folding over this vector um, with this lambda that you have to protect for some reason, well, so it doesn't get evaluated in this context, but it's evaluated in the next context, and it adds all the numbers together to make 18, right? And I didn't actually make a higher order meta function uh, syntax for Quasir, it's just composition works, right? Like, if you, if you can add continuations to things, then that's already higher order meta functions. So there's one thing that's new here, this each, right? Um, each is essentially like a uh, fork, but rather than giving all the parameter pack, uh, all, all, the, all the pack to every one of the uh, um, closures, it accepts the amount of closures that it is expecting as parameters and does like a zip width and then execute kind of a thing, right? So this will be executed on the first parameter, this will be executed on the second parameter. We don't want to do anything with the first parameter because it's the thing we want to add together, so we just use identity just as a placeholder. The second parameter, which would be the lists, right, when folding over this uh, um, pack, would be uh, unpack, which basically takes a list and turns it into a parameter pack. Its continuation is another fold, right, the inner fold, and it adds them all together, resolving to the result of all them and the outer fold then folds that together with plus, right? So we, we can fold over two vectors. It is the other way around. It's essentially inside out, right? With, with normal metaprogramming, you go from innermost to outermost, right? You have uh, F, and then the thing that happens before that is inside of F, and then the thing that happens before that is inside of that F. And uh, with this, uh, you basically read left to right. Like the first thing that happens, all its parameters, last parameter is going to be the continuation. The next thing that happens, all its parameters, it's the last argument is going to be the next thing that happens. So if you get used to it, I think it's actually more readable than, than the other uh, higher order meta function stuff. And it's blazingly fast. I mean, this is insanely fast. And to make that point, um, the only thing that I think we're losing on in MetaBench right now is uh, Cartesian product. And the reason for that is, I mean, we're, uh, I, I should have put that in my slides. Anyway. We're faster than everyone else except for metal. And the reason for that is metal is doing it flat, like as fast as it can go, and we are doing Contrition project product purely in higher order meta functions, right? So our higher order meta functions beat every other library's implementation flat, right? So this is essentially close to zero cost. Uh, how am I doing on time? Five minutes. Okay, this is this is close to the cost of um, just a flat implementation. And in the case that that that's not true, like you could have okay, algorithm A calls algorithm B, and in that combination, I I have like a way of composing those together and making that one operation that's faster. Well, our front end is the only one that actually gives us the ability 
to look ahead at what the next operation is and pattern match against it, right? Um, you know, if I have a, a meta closure, I can look at the fixed parameters, I can make a template specialization of that and say, okay, I'm a transform, is the next thing I'm doing a fold? And then merge those together, right? Uh, we, we called this composition matching is like a special case of pattern matching for a specific composition, right? So, um, you know, if you think about sort of typical higher order meta functions, it's either one thing or one thing, which a continuation of another thing, I don't know, add const, add pointer, right? Or it's a binary uh, predicate or a binary predicate with one, uh, one fixed argument and one on the other. You know, you, there's maybe 20 different cases that uh, cover 95% of all use cases. So we can make pattern matchings for all of those, and then it's essentially exactly as performant as if you had written your own alias, which did the exact same thing under the hood, right? Um, I think it would also be theoretically plausible for, uh, you know, maybe if there's like a, a boost spirit X4 that actually uses a fast metaprogramming library under the hood, um, that, uh, you know, they could say, oh, we're doing this operation all the time, and we could actually theoretically do it faster. They, you, you, as a user, you theoretically could add your own composition matching. Louis? Yeah. Why doesn't Spirit X3 use Hannah? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, I don't really know a lot about uh, sort of the internal workings of Fusion. I actually looked through, uh, sorry, uh, 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 Spirit. I actually looked through Spirit to look for, you know, terribly ugly uh, um, uh, higher order meta functions. I would, you know, look through a lot of boost because I wanted to make sure that we could solve all of the hideous cases with continuations and I wasn't forgetting something. So they, they are using Boost MPL a lot under the hood. Uh, I mean, surely not for everything. I, I understand your point, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so yeah, point taken, it's, it's a bad reference. But, but uh, um, if, if you in your type-based uh, library were uh, using something quite often, then uh, you could theoretically make your own composition matching. And then your code would still be clear and there would be one spot where you would say, well, actually, conceptually, I'm doing that, but I'm you know, combining everything differently under the hood. Questions? Yes. So is the implication of this, uh, well, I'm looking at Hannah versus this. Yeah. Hannah, it seems like what you care about mostly is maintenance costs. Well, Hannah provides a procedural syntax that a lot of people can easily relate to. Yes. So for maintenance, it'll be cheaper. But this, you know, if you don't care about the maintenance as much and you care about client experience, if you want to get 100 times faster, then it seems like that would be the more reasonable approach if, if you care a lot more about your client than you do about the maintenance. Of the you will get 100 times faster than MPL. You won't get 100 times faster than HANA. Uh, sorry, the question was, uh, you know, what are the trade-offs of this versus HANA? Um, uh, I think, when, like, HANA is the vector, right? Like, when in doubt, use HANA. Now and then, you need a hash map, right? Uh, I, 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 I think, uh, um, you know, you probably should anti-sell this kind of thing unless you are a library developer and don't care about Fusion. In that case, it may be quite viable. Uh, I mean, I think you can, you can express a lot of things somewhat terser even than HANA in this, in, you know, these sort of higher order metafunction stuff. Uh, it probably will not, or it definitely will not be more understandable than HANA. I mean, Louis did a really good job building this sort of on top of, you know, category theory and making everything work well and customization points be somewhat logical and so on and so forth. And I've been really trying, but I, you know, I, I'm not going to get anywhere close to that. There will be some things that are not quite intellectually pure and there will definitely be uh, more angle brackets. <laughs> Other questions? Louis.
right? Um, this only works with five people. This is purely the compile runtime. And so the start, the compile runtime start of being able to support runtime values, okay, so having a container that would also accept the runtime values has a compile runtime start. And that is what is uh, um, hurting Hana mainly, right? And also we talked about the fact that the runtime 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 Yes, runtime. that's probably most of it. Um, an another another point I think should be made. Uh, we haven't we haven't really looked into the problem space of Sphene friendliness. Like if you want uh, you know a, a fail deep in the uh, um, in some nested algorithm to c bubble up to the top and remove the function overload, as is the case for example in ranges v3, then uh, this will give you a hard error. And I think there are ways of making it Sphene friendly. But the jury is still out at how much faster that will be than other libraries. So, you know, in the in the case that you need Sphene friendliness, uh, at this point at least, this is not a viable candidate. I mean, I don't like if somebody gives me garbage in my expression templates. I want a hard error. It's their fault. Good, right? You know, it's it's a it's a good clear error message right at the source, right? I mean, the Sphene friendliness gives you the tool to you know make errors somewhere just happen in an overload set removal, and then there's going to be some default that then will. Will will kick in, you know, some some less uh, uh, efficient version or whatever, um, or fallback is not default. But anyway, um, it also makes the error code, uh, you know, the error message sometimes very hard to relate to because you you get an error message, okay, there's no overload that works, and you're like, okay, I have an algorithm with like a nesting depth of just insane. Where did something go wrong? I don't know, right? So, so it, is, it is a debate that I think hasn't really been had yet. It's, it's a little bit like exceptions versus non-exceptions, whereas uh, um, you know, exceptions would be Sphene friendliness because they kind of bubble up and move the, the, the error problem to somewhere else. And you can also catch them as in like Sphene away and some other function gets called. But we haven't really had this debate. And I think this is very relevant to, I mean, there's, there is sort of on the boost queue, I think, uh, um, uh, Peter Dimoff's MP11 has requested a formal review. I think Metal is pretty close. Uh, um, I think Eric didn't really express interest in putting Meta in Boost, and BridgeN definitely wants to go into Boost. Um, I think this is a very relevant argument in a problem space that still needs to be researched before we can really make decisions, because everybody has a different take on trade-offs of Sphene friendliness. That's kind of like, if you were to look at where these libraries are different, um, they're mostly different on Speed, composition, and Sweeney friendliness. Those are the three things that are different. Everything else is just the same. We all steal our other's ideas and yeah. Okay, I think I'm theoretically done, so you can leave if you want. I'm gonna answer questions as long as people keep asking me questions. Yeah. Just a, a comment as a pretty regular Fusion user and uh, Opera author. The Fusion type sequences are only interesting after lots of other metaprogramming for type sending has occurred. Yeah. So I think what would be useful is um, dealing with all of your type system and trying to figure out what you need the fusion thing to look like at the end, and then converting it into the fusion thing, which is what we typically do in, for example, Spirit and some of the other libraries yeah. that heavily use it. And so if, if there was something that we could do the type calculation using your library and then convert that into a HANA type that is fusion friendly, then that kind of has the win of everything. Because I don't need I don't need fusion capabilities as I'm value types as I'm as I'm calculating what I finally want my in type to be, right? That's useless. It doesn't buy me anything. I don't need the intermediate result. Yeah. Um so the question was uh um or the comment well was 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 uh um 
when using Fusion or, or sort of uh, 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 runtime, compile time uh, uh, combinations, there's usually a lot of compile time calculations that go with that. It's not all Fusion. And my response to that is, uh, Yes, I kind of agree. I, I mean, it's not really my domain, so I haven't explored that problem space. And I think Louis has probably a, a related comment. Yeah. I think that's already starting to happen. Where was I, I forgot his name. There was a, one of your uh, uh, um, collaborators was kind of already doing that. Ah, uh, yeah, there you are. What, what was your name again? Jason. Jason, yes. Jason, uh, uh, I guess, has already kind of started experimenting with that. Um, the, I mean, okay, you are, you are, you are paying for the. Uh, um, Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think I mean I think that's one of the one of the ways to uh, um, uh, solve the problem for a certain set of uh, use cases. The other way you could do it is you could just use this stuff and you know that listify that was at the end that turns everything into list that's the return. You could make a handle tuplify, right? I mean the the final uh, or, or tuple underscore c or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, tuple underscore t. Yeah, um, you could just you know have that be the last operation. Take that pack, put it into a handle tuple t, and then put that into whatever fusion stuff you're doing. I mean they 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 do work together pretty well, right? A tutorial. Okay, so the question was, uh, wouldn't you have to make major changes to the HANA uh, interface? And I've, I've talked to Louis a bit about this. Like, if you were using like a, a predicate add that was already in HANA, we could pattern match against that and say, oh, we know that that lambda that you passed in, that's just an add, and then we wouldn't have to use it every step in the transform. We could actually use our super fast alias-based add and then uh, 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 turn it back to uh, um, HANA stuff. If you were to use your own custom lambda, then we would actually have to instantiate a uh, you know the the the, the template uh, operator overload for every type combinational thing. It would probably still be faster than Hannah is now, but that would be a pretty big uh, performance hit because you know if 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 you take the naive example of add, we can do that with just aliases, right? Like uh, um, yeah. Other questions? Okay, thanks guys. <laughs> <laughs>